The European Union says it's planning a response to Russia for cutting gas, gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland. The bloc also says it's prepared if Moscow turns off the tap for its other member countries. Poland says it has plenty of natural gas on reserve and it's ready to be fully independent from Russian supply. Bulgaria has slammed Moscow's move as blackmail and vowed not to give in to what it considers racketeering. Както вече споменах, всички търговски правни отношения са спазени. Очевидно е ясно, че към момента природния газ се използва повече като политическо и економическо оръжие в формат на водената война, а не правно търговско отношение. По правно търговските отношения българската страна няма абсолютно никакви нарушения. And for more, this Rosie Bircher joins us live from Brussels. Rosie, as we just heard, Poland says it's ready to be independent of Russian gas supplies. But you have many other EU member states who might not be in that position. How big of an impact will this gas suspension have on all these other countries? Well, first of all, this really is seen as a dramatic escalation, this standoff between Brussels and Moscow as they trade these sanctions and counter sanctions over the war in Ukraine. Now, of course, the biggest impact today on those countries that are affected, Poland and Bulgaria. Poland saying that it can weather this storm, that its gas reserves are filled to at least 75 percent. And the energy minister in Poland has really sought to quell domestic fears, saying that there will be no shortage for Polish homes. Now, Bulgaria, on the other hand, gets around 90% of its gas from Russia. So now it's been left scrambling to look for alternatives. Greece, which is another member of the European Union, has already offered to help. But this move from Moscow will, of course, really concentrate minds and raise fears in capitals across the European Union, not least in Berlin, because Germany is reliant on Russia for its gas supplies. And there has been a, a plan block-wide across the EU to reduce reliance on Russian gas by two-thirds by the end of this year. But it looks like that just simply might not be fast enough. Arozi, EU chief Ursula von der Leyen planning, says she, has, uh, she is planning a coordinated response. Uh, looking ahead, what might this response involve? Well, we're about to hear what that response will involve in the next few minutes. Ursula von der Leyen has just announced that she is due to speak to press in the next few minutes or so. But previewing that, what we might expect is uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, referencing a lot of the work that's already been done by the European Union to try and diversify supplies away from Russia. So the European Union has been in talks with countries including Qatar and Norway and Nigeria to try and diversify those energy supplies. And they've also struck a big deal with Washington to try and increase imports of liquefied natural gas. But that's just something that can't happen overnight because the EU simply doesn't have enough infrastructure in place to accept a really radical increase in LNG imports overnight. So perhaps a continuation of plans to diversify and also some contingency measures and solidarity among EU member states on the cards. But above all, perhaps we're looking forward in the next few days to tighter sanctions on Moscow in response to this and a retaliation from Brussels. We might see more sanctions proposed in the coming days, particularly a ban on oil imports. That's something Ukraine has been calling for. Oh, thanks for that. Look ahead. Rosie Birchett for us there in Brussels. On the ground in Ukraine, Russian forces have pushed deeper into the east of the country, capturing several villages. Troops are said to be moving more methodically compared to earlier stages of the war. John Gambrel joins us live from Lviv. Uh, John, why the focus on Izium and Kharkiv by Russian forces? This focus comes after Russian forces in the initial part of the war focused most of their attention on trying to take Kiev in a so-called decapitation strike to, to push out the government and install potentially what analysts described as a pro-Russian government. That obviously failed. Uh, Ukraine is still fighting right now. And Russia, it seems to what they have done is redeploy the forces that they did have in that area back to the east. The east is a predominantly Russian-speaking area of Ukraine. It has vast uh, industrial uh, applications vast industrial plants, as well as agriculture. And it's viewed as crucial to potentially, as analysts describe, expand the scope of uh, Russia's uh, influence in the region. 
Now, we've got uh, the UN Secretary General who is heading to Kyiv to meet President Zelensky tomorrow. Uh, it should be an interesting meeting. What can we expect? Well, Antonio Gutierrez will come here after visiting with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Uh, that meeting uh, saw both of them basically uh, sit at that long table that's been uh, pretty famous. And we didn't see anything of, of substance necessarily come out. Now, Zelensky had been saying that he was upset that uh, Guterres chose to go to Moscow first. Uh, Ukraine has also been asking for uh, Russia to allow them to uh, open a humanitarian corridor. They've asked the international community, uh, particularly the UN, as well as the International Committee of the Red Cross, to guarantee uh, a safe corridor for those still inside of the Mariupol steel plant to leave if they want to. Now, this has been a real point of contention. Uh, Russia said that they were going to offer a ceasefire. The Ukrainians said they didn't believe them. And just today we had the UK military say that they believe that Russia was using unguided munitions targeting that steel mill. That, that, those untargeted uh, munitions can cause wide area damage and don't necessarily hit the targets that they're supposed to, which raise the risk of further civilian casualties. John Gramble reporting from Lviv. Thank you.